did, get out your Bibles and open up to John 3, John chapter 3, this morning as uh, <clears throat> we're going to be continuing, <clears throat> excuse me, with what we were doing last Sunday. We want to welcome those of you that are joining us right now uh, via our live stream. We appreciate you tuning in or somebody who might be watching this after the fact. Um, this morning we're going to be continuing what we were working on last Sunday, which is the topic of born again or regenerated, is there a difference? And today we're going to be looking at part two of this subject, okay? Now, um, uh, this subject matter is uh, one of some controversy. I don't know if some of you have followed any of the uh, comments that were made this past week on the church's YouTube video um, from last Sunday, but let's just say there are some folks that were not necessarily thrilled with what I had to say about this topic. And, um, you know, that's their prerogative to not necessarily agree my only thing is I would ask for what is your reason for not agreeing? And my, my, pur my purpose is not to answer any particular teacher. My purpose is not to address a specific message or study that somebody else has presented on this. And as I said last Sunday, my purpose is just to explain how I've come to think about this topic. And if it happens to challenge what somebody else has said or what somebody else thinks, that's a secondary outcome of the message, not the primary intent of what I want to go over. So as I said last Sunday, the primary issue that I'm dealing with here is, is it appropriate to call believers today born again? And I tried to lay out for you last Sunday that there, is some, there are some within um, dispensationalism, uh, mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalism, etc., that will adamantly say, no, it is not appropriate. That is language that only appears in the Gospels or in First Peter, and so therefore it is not language that we should be using. It's only John in John 3 and Peter in First Peter chapter 1, verse, 22, or verse 23, that use the phrase born again, so therefore that is terminology that does not apply to the body of Christ. And um, Paul never uses the term, so therefore we should not. It's not a Pauline term. Last Sunday what I tried to do is lay out for you the reasoning behind why there are folks that make that argument, okay? Why do people say that born again is not terminology that applies to us? And we went through a lot of verses last Sunday talking about Israel, talking about uh, God's dealings with Israel in time past, in, in, in both the law and then in the prophets and so forth. If you look with me at John 3, John 3, <clears throat> verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old, and how can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We do pray this morning that as we look again a little bit more detail at the topic that we started last Sunday, that we'll have clarity and understanding from your word. Lord, I pray that we will allow your word to be our teacher, not tradition, be it religious tradition or be it grace tradition, but your word and the Holy Spirit that seals and indwells each and every one of us as members of the church, the body of Christ. We pray that as we look at this, that we will uh, present material and information in the right spirit, in a way that can be persuasive, in a way that will be um, uh, done so as to convince folks and not be overly heavy-handed, etc. We're grateful for the time we could spend together in your word. In Christ's name, amen. So the verses we just read there a moment ago are related to the issue at hand, right? And particularly verse 7. Everybody look at verse 7. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Does everybody see the second half of verse 7 where it says ye must be born again? It is from that statement, ye, which is plural. Now in verse 7, Jesus is talking to who? He's talking to Nicodemus, right? How do we know that? Look at what verse 7 says. Marvel not that I said unto thee. The. Who's the thee? The thee is Nicodemus, right? Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Well, who is Nicodemus? Go to verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto him, Nicodemus, art thou a master of Israel, right? 
So the idea is that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He's a Pharisee. He's a master in Israel. And he tells him that ye, or all of Israel, needs to be born again. Therefore, being born again is not terminology that applies to the body of Christ. Uh, We went, don't turn there. We went last Sunday to Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, where Jesus calls Israel his firstborn, right? And how Israel was God's firstborn nation. And the idea is that in order to be born again, you had to be born the first time, right? And so the idea is that God birthed the nation through the Exodus back there in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 4. And and, and, and subsequent passages uh, dealing with Moses going in and leading e- uh, Israel out of Egyptian bondage, etc. Mark, can you bring that up? I'm going to need it here shortly. And then we can just leave it up in-house um, as, as we go through things here this morning. Um, and so there's the first birth, which is Israel's physical birthing of a, as a nation, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. And then there is a second birth, a being born again, which is their spiritual birth. And so being born again only applies to Israel. That's the logic in a nutshell. I said a lot more about that, but I'm just trying to review here this morning so that we can move ahead. So therefore, being born again only applies to the nation of Israel and has no application to the body of Christ. It's asserted, and also, therefore, using that terminology to describe somebody today in the dispensation of grace would be a misappropriation of terms, would be wrong and inaccurate to do that according to what many have said about this, okay? So, look, is it true that Paul never uses the phrase born again? That's true. You can search Paul's epistles and will you ever find the phrase born again? You will not find those exact words in Paul, but what I tried to come over to Titus chapter 3, what I tried to show you at the end of last Sunday's message was Paul may not use the term born again, but does he use the term regeneration? Okay, regeneration is a Pauline term. So those folks who object to the use of the term born again on account of the fact that it is an Israel term that is used in a Jewish context in John 3 by Jesus Christ, talking to Nicodemus, a master in Israel, and he says that the nation needs to be born again, therefore that doesn't apply to us, Christ Uh, through Paul, does say that the church, those of us who are saved today in this dispensation, have been regenerated. Look at Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Was anyone here saved by their own effort, their own work, their own ability to make God happy with them? No. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, here it is. By the washing of regeneration... And the renewing of what? The Holy Ghost. And so I said to you last Sunday that those who are opposed to the idea of calling themselves born again, they certainly would, should not have the same opposition to the idea of being regenerated. And I do want to run through with you again here in the beginning, in the review, the information that I presented to you from the dictionary as far as the meaning of the word regenerated. So I would direct your attention to one of the monitors. And Mark, if you could bring this up for the uh, online audience, I would appreciate it. So the first thing is we have here is the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of regenerated. For some reason, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary is online is still down, but if you look up the word regeneration in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, it just says a spiritual rebirth or a new birth spiritually. The OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, is the pinnacle of English dictionaries. It is a behemoth. It has basically every word ever in the history of the English language in here as far as its history and word usage and multiple definitions. So let's look at here. I'm going to start reading right here where it marks the etymology of the word. So please follow along. It says, Anglo-Norman and Middle Middle French, regeneration, Middle French, regeneration. Notice, process or fact of being spiritually reborn. So the word regeneration means the process or the fact of being spiritually what? Reborn. That's what the word regeneration means, all right? Formation of new tissue cells. It's antimon, post-classical, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stuff here that we don't care about. But look at the number one definition of the word right here that I have circled. The action of coming 
or bringing into renewed existence, recreation, rebirth, restoration. So is the word regeneration in English related to the idea of a new birth? Okay, so let's look at a few more things. Here's the second definition. Notice the process or fact of being spiritually what? Reborn. The state resulting from this. So if we're talking about regeneration, and Paul says in Titus 3.5 that we are saved by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, is he talking about a spiritual rebirth? Is he talking about a new birth spiritually of God the Holy Spirit, right? It is the state, regeneration is the state that results from the process of having been what? Reborn, by definition of what the dictionary says. We could look this word up in the Middle English Dictionary, okay? And we could go all the way back to the Middle English Dictionary, and we could look at word usages between the year 1000 and the year 1500, and look in Middle English, and notice what, when we do, that the second definition means spiritual what? Regeneration. So the word has a multi hundreds of year history as having been used in the English language to talk about the idea of re spiritual rebirth. Okay, We could also look at the online etymological dictionary. You can see right here, it says from the middle 14th century, that would be the 1300s. The act of regenerating or producing a new, originally spiritual, notice, also of the resurrection from Old French and directly from late Latin, notice, a being born what? Again, the word regeneration means to be what? Born again. That's what the word means, okay? Now, how were you saved according to Titus 3.5? You were saved by the washing of what? regeneration, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, okay? That's how you were saved. And then we can look down here and see that the word was originally theological related to the radical spiritual change in an individual accomplished by the direct action of God. That's what the word means. How were you regenerated? Did you stand there and wave your arms and say, ooh, 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 pick me? Or were you regenerated by the divine action of God through the death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay? So this, these are what the words mean. Now, we could also look at the translational history. In English, the Greek word that is translated regeneration is the same. It doesn't matter if you're looking at the traditional Texas Receptus Greek text supporting the King James, or if you're looking at the... Um, Critical text, the Greek word is the same. Notice how Tyndall rendered the word. New birth. When William Tyndall is translating the Bible in 1526 out of Greek into English, how does he render the Greek word? He renders it as what? New birth. What does the word regeneration mean? New birth. Coverdale, what does he say? New birth. We could go to the Matthews Bible. What does Matthew say? New birth. We could go to the Great Bible. Great Bible says new what? New birth. We could look at the Geneva Bible, one of the great predecessors of the King James. It says what? New birth. All through Tyndall, Coverdale, Matthews, Great Bible, Geneva Bible, all five of them rendered it as how? New birth, right? And it's not until you get to the Bishop's Bible, that which, is the, which is the immediate predecessor of the King James, that you see the word what? Regeneration. But what does regeneration mean? Regeneration means, I just showed you in the OED, I showed you in the online etymological dictionary, I showed you that it means to be what? Reborn. It means to have a new birth. That's what the word means. Okay? Now, I'm going to skip this stuff for now, and I want to, we'll come back to that if we have time. I want to direct your attention here. So one of the things I know about people that are listening is they have this idea that words can mean specific things just because they're in a King James Bible that they cannot historically have been proved to mean. So it's this idea that just because a word is in the King James Bible, that the King James Bible is its own dictionary, that you don't need anything else, that, that, that it, it will define the word for you. And if, the, if it says regenerated, then that's because God wanted it to say what? 
regenerated. And it's almost this double inspiration idea, this idea that there's some sort of extra spiritual unction upon the translators as they set this out, okay? Now, what I have up here on the screen right now, folks, this is a book called The Table Alphabetical. The Table Alphabetical is one of the first dictionaries to ever be written, and I want you to note the date of this thing. What year is this thing published? 1604. What year did King James authorize the Bible to be translated that bears his name? 1604. So would the table alphabetical dating from 1604 be a primary source to, the way, to what words meant between 1604 and 1611 when the translation was made? Now, I had a brain fart last week, and for some reason I didn't look at this until last Monday, and when I looked at what the table alphabetical had to say about the words regeneration and regenerated, I about fell out of my seat, okay? And here's why. So what I'm about to show you is recording what the word meant in 1604 when the translation was being done. So is this a primary source to the meaning of words at the time of the translation, okay? So if we look up the word, oh, look at that. Regeneration, what does it mean? Born again. If we look up the word regeneration, what does it mean? New birth. Now look, folks, at what point are we just going to accept evidence? Okay, at what point are folks going to just accept evidence? There's an idea that I've encountered, and that's the idea that dictionaries are changing the definition of words. Folks, this is confused. Dictionaries record the definition of words. Do the words do, does the definition of words change over time? Of course it does. But a responsible dictionary re records and catalogs how the words have changed their meaning over time, right? I am showing you a dictionary from 1604, a primary source to the King James Bible that says that the word regenerate means to be born again and that the word regeneration means new birth, okay? So at what point, and, and, and there are some people out there that don't like the fact that I'm going to dictionaries. They don't like the fact that I'm showing documentary evidence of what I'm saying. And what I'm saying to you folks here in the assembly and anybody that's out there listening is, if you are wanting me to teach in such a way that I am going to look at, look at objective, verifiable evidence as to the meanings of words and say, that can't mean that because it's because the word doesn't mean what my preconception says it means in a King James Bible, then you should just stop listening to my teaching, <laughs> okay? Because that's not me. I will go occasionally and look at a Greek word. Ha anybody that is listening in this church or out there online, have you ever heard me correct and say something was wrong in your English Bible? You've never heard me do that, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point where the, the level of frustration here is getting to a point where we cannot even look up words in an English dictionary. That frustrates me. I'm just being honest about it. Because that means then that words cannot mean what they can historically been proven to mean in the time period that the word is under usage. Folks, we are admittedly reading a 400-plus old Bible the language has changed from then. I am not saying we get rid of it and, and get a new, a modern version, but what I am saying is, do we need to understand what words meant at the time that this thing was written? And here it is. You are saved by what? Regeneration. Regeneration means what? New birth. If you are regenerate, if you are in a state of having been regenerated, are you born again by definition of what the word means? Okay, Mark, um, we can leave this up in-house. We'll come back to it in a little bit. Now, <clears throat> John 3. Folks, just going to make one more comment. I try to teach you guys in an evidentiary way so that you do not have to just take my word for things. Okay, I would rather show you more evidence and more documentation for why I'm saying it so that you can see there's a reason why I'm saying it than for me to just stand here and make stuff up and say things that aren't true. Okay, so 
That's where I'm coming from. That's the premise I've come from. We're going to leave these definitions up here as we work our way through here. Okay? So, what does it mean then to be born again? Come back with me to John chapter 3. Come back with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 3. Okay? John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, so talking to Nicodemus, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in the context, we talked about this earlier, okay? Verily, verily, I say unto who? Thee. Who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to Nicodemus. Now watch, except a man be born again, he cannot enter what? Or cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, when Jesus says a man, how many people is he talking about there? One, it's singular. He's talking about a man. Now watch, it, just so you don't miss it, except a man be born again, he. How many people is that? One. So except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Is Jesus talking to Nicodemus about individual people? Uh, sure seems like it, right? Verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man, did Nicodemus misunderstand him? No. How can a man, when he is old, still talking about how many people? One. When he is old, can he, third time, singular, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? The answer is what? Physically, is that possible? It's not physically possible, right? So, now understand, let's go back and, and look at it again. Jesus tells Nicodemus that a man, in verse 3, must be born again, and if he's not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, right? And so here's Nicodemus now in the next verse. Does he ask him the logical question? So if somebody, so, so Nicodemus hears Jesus say that, and he's like, what are you talking about? How can I be born again? Verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is what? Old. So Nicodemus is thinking here about physical what? Birth, right? How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus hears Jesus talking about a man being born again, and that if that man does not, if that man is not born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, right? And he goes, Well, how can that man enter a second time into his mother's womb? Is anything so far beyond the singular? Jesus and Nicodemus are talking about individual what? People. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man. How many is that? That's one. Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he, the same man, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, where, so they're having this conversation and they're talking so far about what? Individual people. Verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Verse 7, and mar now watch, and marvel not that I said unto thee, who's that? Nicodemus, ye must be born again, okay? So there we have the application now to who? All of Israel, right? The ye is plural, right? Does all of Israel need to be born again? But each, in the, each Israelite, Nicodemus himself, is only responsible for who? Themselves. So obviously there is an individual aspect of this that results in a corporate thing, right? All of the individual Israelites who are born again, are they, go, are they then part of the little flock? Are they part of the believing remnant? Are they part of the, the group within Israel that is hearing the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and are responding to it the way they're supposed to, and are they born again? Okay? So Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about what each individual Israelite must do. They must be born again. Okay? Now, what does being born again mean? What, in this context, what does being born again mean? Look with me again at verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? 
How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water. Now, in the context, the water is, goes with verse 4. And you know that if you've ever been related to, uh, if you've ever seen a baby being born or anything like that, does the baby pass through water as it's being born? In fact, one of the clear signs that a, a, a mother is getting ready to bear her child is the fact that her water, what, breaks, right? And so understand, G Nicodemus asked the question in verse 4. The question was, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's, what, womb? So Jesus is answering Nicodemus' question, and his question was, how in the world can somebody be born again when they're old? How can they go back inside their mother's what? Womb. And then Jesus says in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. That would be his first what? Birth. That would be his physical what? Birth. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into what? How did that just define what being born again is? Being born again is being born of the what? The spirit. Having a spirit birth. Having a new birth of who? The spirit. All of, every human being that's walking planet earth that has ever lived, have they all gone through a physical birth? Every human being that has ever been on planet earth, have they all gone through a second birth? Have they all been born again? Have they all been born of the Spirit? No. So being born again is simply the idea of being born of the Spirit in the context. Now, hold your hand there and come over to Matthew 3. Here's the problem. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Nicodemus is part of the religious leadership structure of the nation of Israel. And what were they trusting in for their salvation? They were trusting in the fact that they were of the seed of who? Of Abraham. They were trusting in the fact that they had the right kind of flesh. That they weren't sinners of the Gentiles, that they were Israelites. They were part of the favored nation. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. John the Baptist talking here. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, stop right there. Is that the same class of people that Nicodemus belonged to? Yes, okay. He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Whew. John, John's going after him here, okay. Verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. See, what were they trusting in? They were trusting in the fact that they had the right kind of physical birth. They were trusting in the fact that they had the right lineage, that they had the right descendancy, right? Meanwhile, are they violating the law six ways from Sunday with all their tradition that they've added to the law? But they don't care about that. They care that they're the right kind of flesh, right? Right? And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham, right? Now, Jesus, go back to John 3, Jesus in John 3 is talking to Nicodemus, a member of that group that John just told off there in, John, in Matthew 3, and what Jesus is going to tell Nicodemus in John 3 is that, listen, you don't, you, your, your physical birth doesn't mean anything as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. What matters is whether or not you are born of the Spirit. Whether or not you are born what? Again. So God, through John the Baptist, through Jesus Christ, through the 12 apostles and the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, is he calling out of greater Israel a believing remnant? And does each individual Israelite have a responsibility to decide whether they're going to believe that message or not. And those who believe the message are, are, are identifying themselves now, not with the apostate wider nation out there, but with the group that the, uh, Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 32 calls the little flock. They are identifying themselves with the little flock, with the believing remnant. Okay? 
So the physical death there in Matthew 3, their physical birth, excuse me, as the seed of Abraham was not enough. They needed to be born what? Again. They needed to have a spiritual what? Birth. And that's what being born again means. It simply means to be born of the Spirit. So don't turn there, but in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Oh, just do it. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Who is going to receive the kingdom? The folks that are going to receive the kingdom. Think about John 3. John 3 said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, right? What does being born again mean? Being born again means to be born of the Spirit. Who is going to inherit and receive the kingdom of God? It is all of the individuals within Israel who have been born again. It is all of the individuals in Israel who are born again, who are now part of the little flock. See, here's the thing. You cannot read John 3 and overemphasize the corporate at the expense of the individual. The, individ the corporate group that is going to receive and enter the kingdom is made up of individuals who have been what? Born again. So there is a corporate thing there, yes, but is there also an individual thing? Now, so all born again individuals in Israel were made part of the little flock, the group that would receive the kingdom, the believing remnant. So being born again is first and foremost an individual reality that then identifies one with the larger group. It's an individual reality that identifies an Israelite with the larger group. The collective group of born-again ones, the collective group of believing Israel, are the ones that are part of the little flock are going to inherit what? The kingdom. But if Nicodemus or the rest of the Pharisees aren't born again because they're trusting in their, their pedigree, their physical birth as, and their flesh to get it done, are they going to be a part of the group? No. So then that, all of that raises the question, then are members of the body of Christ born again? Well, look at what's on the screen. The easy answer is to say what? Of course. Of course they're born again, right? Well, let's look at this a little bit deeper. So, are members of the body of Christ born again? The question you need to ask yourself is this. Are we today in this dispensation born of the Spirit? If we are, then are we born again? Hello. Okay? If we are born of the Spirit, are we born again? Yes, by definition of what it means to be born again. Now, did Paul go to Titus chapter 3? Did Paul call you in Titus chapter 3 regenerated? Go back to Titus 3. You could put that up quick again, Mark, if you would. <clears throat> See, here's the problem. What, what, what we are dealing with in this message is, I hate to say it, there's no other way to say it, but a tradition. A tradition that has developed within the rightly dividing space that that can't be us we can't be born again because John 3 is talking, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. But, do, but are we regenerated? The question is, are we born of the Spirit? It, the question of whether or not we're born again is a question of whether or not as believers today in the body of Christ, are we born of the Spirit? And I'm going to tell you right now, the answer to that is what? Yes. How do you think you got in the body of Christ? You got in the body of Christ because you were born of the Spirit. If you're not born of the Spirit, you're dead in Adam. I really seriously don't understand why this is so hard. Okay? So, so Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. 
How? By the washing of what? Regeneration. So what does regeneration mean? It means to have a new what? A new birth. You cannot be a regenerated person and not have been born again by definition of what the words mean. So yes, Paul does not use the phrase born again, but does he use the word New, does he use the word regeneration that means new birth, which is the same thing that Tyndall and Coverdale and Matthews and the Great Bible and all the, and the Geneva Bible and all those Bibles had when it said new birth. So here's the situation. If the translators had never changed the word from new birth to regeneration, everyone would be reading a Bible that said new birth and we wouldn't have a problem with it. But because we have an over-superstitious view of, what the Bi- of a King James Bible, we end up with having to have messages like this. Okay? Now, are we born of the Spirit? Go to Galatians 4. Remember, the base definition of being born again is to be born of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, verse 28. Oops, that's the wrong chapter. Okay, yeah, verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh, that's who, Ishmael, right? He that was born after the flesh persecuted him. Notice, that was born after the Spirit. Even so, it is when. Now, folks, if you are a believer today, are you born after the Spirit? That's what it says. Go to Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. If you're just joining us, the definitions on the screen are from the table alphabetical from 1604. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the what? Spirit. If so be, the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Hello, so during the the saved, during the dispensation of grace, they must have the Spirit of God. If they don't have the Spirit of God, they're none of His. Is that what this verse says? It's what it says. Go to verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the what? The sons of God. What makes you a son of God? What makes you a son of God is that you have the Spirit of God. How did you get the Spirit of God? You had a new birth of God the Holy Spirit when you trusted the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you believed and relied exclusively on His shed blood for you on the cross as the only total complete payment for your sin, did you receive the Spirit and were you born after the Spirit? And if you were born after the Spirit, were you regenerated, and are, have you been born again? Okay. Rome, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How can you be a child of God without being spiritually born? The answer is you can't. I went to the verse last time. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened who were what? Dead. You were spiritually dead as a doornail. You were alive physically and walking around, but you were spiritually what? Dead. What you needed was a new birth of God the Holy Spirit. You needed to be regenerated. You needed to be born again. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth where? Folks, did you get saved without the Holy Spirit coming inside you? No. Go back to Galatians chapter 3. Go back to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by what? The hearing of faith. See, a believer receives the Spirit by faith at the time they trust the gospel. How do I know? This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of what? So when you trust and believe, when you place faith in the faith of Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, and you rely exclusively on that and that alone, in that moment, in that nanosecond, does God the Holy Spirit come inside you, and does he do something and regenerate and bring new spiritual life to, a, to your inner man and make you alive unto God? You needed to be reborn, folks. You needed to be born again. No, being born again means you are born of the Spirit. Israel needed that. In their program, they needed that. And each individual Israelite needed to be born again so that they could participate in the collective thing that God was going to do through the believing remnant, through the little flock. In the same way, you and I need to be what? Born again. So that we could be a part of the body of Christ. And so there's, just like there was in Israel's program, there's that individual thing that places you into the corporate identity. Chapter 4, Galatians 4, verse 6. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your what? Hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Where is the Spirit of God today? He's in your heart. You used to have a desperately wicked heart before you were saved, but did you experience a rebirth, a new birth in your inner man of God the Holy Spirit when you trusted Christ? Yes. So go back to Titus chapter 3. Go back to Titus chapter 3, and let's look at something else. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration, does that verse end there? No. And the what? Renewing. Of who? Huh. Who's doing the regenerating and the renewing? See, here's the thing, whether all of you guys want to admit it or not, every single one of us needed some R&R. Not rest and relaxation, but regeneration and renewing. Okay? Renewing. Do we still have this up, Mark? Here is the definition of renew. Renew. Two definitions, to make new or like new, again, to restore. Ver- definition number two, the process of being spiritually what? Reborn. So, you were regenerated and you were renewed. And both were accomplished by who? The Holy Spirit. Here's the uh, online etymological dictionary. Renew. Again, we got late 14th century here. So this would be, this definition is from the 1300s. And we can see here that renew to make like new. 
Um, <clears throat> and it said somewhere in here about uh, also figurative of spiritual states, souls, etc. So the and the word here, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that there just for a minute. The word here, renewed, means the underlying word. Look at verse five. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay? The word that is translated renewing there means a renewal, a renovation, a complete change for the better. So the Holy Spirit, he went in there and he renewed everything. And in renewing everything, did he regenerate did he regenerate your spirit? Did he give you a new birth of the Spirit of God? And this is how you were saved. Look at the verse. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he what? Saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay? So we can take that down temporarily, Mark, and I need all of you guys to go back, get, keep Titus 3 in one hand, and go get 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Go get 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. Therefore, if any man beware, beware. So this only applies to people who are where in Christ. Why? Because only people who are in Christ have been renewed and regenerated. People who are not in Christ are dead in trespasses and sins. They're in Adam. This doesn't apply to them. They need to be born again. They need to have a spiritual birth. Verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Creature. So if you are saved today, are you a new creature? How did you become a new creature? You became a new creature because you had a spiritual birth of God the Holy Spirit. You, had a spirit, you, you individually had a spiritual birth of God the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit put you into Christ, and then he put you into Christ, and you become a, a member of the corporate body of Christ. But the only people who are in the body of Christ are those who have been regenerated and renewed. Now look at the verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are what? Passed away. Behold, all things are become what? Why? How? How did they become new? Because you had a renewing of who? The Holy Ghost. You cannot identify with that verse if you haven't been regenerated and renewed. You are not a new creature for whom old things are passed away and all things have become new if you are not saved. In order for you to be saved, did you need to be born of the Spirit? Did you need to be regenerated and renewed? So how is it that old things are passed away and all things have become new? Is because God the Holy Spirit went inside you, cleaned house, gave you new life, birthed you of God the Holy Spirit through the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ and made you a new creature in whom? In Christ. So, Mark, you can bring it back up. I want to go back to John 3. I'm going to go back to, go back to John 3. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, what does, whoops, what does regeneration mean? Again, this is the 1604 table alphabetical here. What does it mean? 
It means new birth. It means born what? Again. Okay? So let's go back here. So notice, I have the interlinear called up here so I could show you something. You see the word born here? In that verse, verse 3, look at verse 3. Except a man be born again. That word born is a translation of one Greek word. And the word again is a translation of a different what? You see that? Yes? Okay. Notice that this word born is, the, is, is uh, 1080 Greek uh, in the Strong's. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 15. Paul says here, for though ye have had, speaking to the Corinthians, ye have had 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. Watch, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you. How? Is Paul the spiritual father or the physical father of the Corinthians? He's their spiritual father. So did they have a physical birth through their physical earthly parents? But are they begotten? Are they born? Are they spiritually begotten uh, in Christ Jesus through the preaching of Paul's gospel? Are they born again? Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Why? Because they had a birth of God, the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of the gospel, through the ministry of Paul. And Paul speaks of how I begot you, I born you, I birthed you through the gospel. This is not their first birth. This is not their physical birth through their mother. This is their spiritual what? Birth. Go to Philemon verse 10. Now look, folks, you can get mad if you want for me putting up Greek words on a screen and drawing lines, if you want. But let me just say something. At the end of the day, the textual facts remain the textual facts. It doesn't matter if you like them or not. This, these are facts. So whatever you're going to say about this, you're going to have to deal with it in a factual way and simply saying... Well, you don't need to ever look at Greek, is not going to get it done. Not in the realm of not in the realm of folks who are interested in being persuaded by arguments. If you want to just maintain a tradition, then go ahead and maintain the tradition. But what I'm showing you are textual facts. They don't go away. At the end of the day, the words meant what they, they mean what they mean. The translation is the translation. The words are what they are. They, they say what they say. They mean what they say. Verse 10, Philemon verse 10. I, Paul, beseech thee, Philemon, for my son, Onesimus. I mean... Certainly what Paul means there is that he's the physical father of Onesimus, right? What do you mean? That's wrong? I beseech you for my son Onesimus, whom I have what? Begotten. Paul preached the gospel. Did Onesimus hear the gospel? Through Hearing the gospel preached by Paul, did Onesimus hear the gospel, believe the gospel, trust the gospel, believe Christ died on the cross for his sins, was buried, and rose again, and did he receive new birth of the Spirit through Paul's teaching ministry? So Paul says, and he calls Onesimus, he says, he calls him my what? Son. Whoops. Not physical son, but what? What does he call Timothy? He calls Timothy my own son after the common faith. So go back to Titus chapter 3. Titus 
Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Folks, were you born again? Yes, you were. Being born again simply means that you are born of the Spirit and you cannot be in the body of Christ if you are not born of the Spirit. You, need, you cannot be a new creature if you were not regenerated and renewed. And who does those processes according to the verse? The renewing of the Holy Ghost. God, the Holy Spirit, does it. Not you, not me. It's who? The Spirit. And once you are regenerated, once you are renewed, you are a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What R&R, regeneration and renewing, is about is about the mechanics of how you became a new creature. So, the basic point, folks, of John 3 passage is that under the kingdom program, one needed to have a spiritual rebirth, a spiritual birth, excuse me, after their natural birth if they wanted to see the kingdom of God. Do you? And by the way, you look at this chart over here, I don't have my laser pointer on me, but if you look at this chart over here, you've got Israel's program, you've got the mystery program. You have the prophetic program, you have the mystery program, right? And, all, and we understand the distinctions and all the things that are there, right? But you need to not lose sight that all of that is the eternal purpose of God. All of it. What God's going to do prophetically through Israel and what he intends to do through us, the body of Christ, through the revelation of the mystery and the Pauline apostleship, right? It is all the, it is all the eternal purpose of God, right? And yes, there are distinctions. Yes, there are divisions that need to be made and they need to be made rightly. But there are also similarities. An Israelite in that program needed to be born of the Spirit to see the kingdom of God. For you to be a new creature, you need to be born of the Spirit too. So I personally have no problem saying that I'm born again. I have no problem saying it because I understand what regeneration means. I understand what, what, what that means. I understand that I cannot be a new creature without an operation of God the Holy Spirit having been performed on me. Now, do people still use the term born again in confusing ways sometimes? I would say yes, they do. When you are unsure what somebody means, can you ask them politely a clarifying question? What do you mean by that when you say you're born again? You don't need to jump down their throat with both barrels on your doctrinal shotgun ready to tear their heart out. And correct them with all manner of, by the way, not meekly instructing them that oppose themselves. Okay? So the basic point of John 3 passage is that under the kingdom program, one had to have a spiritual birth after their natural birth. During the dispensation of grace, one must also have a spiritual birth after their natural birth if they want to be a part of the body of Christ. So let's not fail to see the connections. In our desire to rightly divide and to, 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 to notice the divisions, which we need to do, I'm not saying we don't need to do that, but in our, in our desire to note the divisions, we need, to, we need to not overlook the connections. The things that are transdispensational, if you will. And again, I'm glad that I was renewed and regenerated. Because if I was not, I would be lost and dead in sin still. And isn't it interesting that Paul says in Ephesians 2, and you hath he quickened. What does quickened mean? It means to make alive. So you need to have been made alive spiritually when you were formerly what? 
dead. So did you need a new birth? Did you? Okay, well, okay, sorry, we won't call it new birth. Did you need a new quickening? Did you need a new quickening? Yes. And on the basis of the new quickening, are you a new creature? Look, folks, I know I got a little testy at some points possibly in this message, but I'm serious. We got to stop functioning like a bunch of superstitious Gentiles just because of a certain word. And if you think that what I've done by putting that dictionary up there is, a, is to bastardize the King James Bible, I don't know what to say to you. Because that's what the word meant in 1604. That's what it meant when, the King James, when King James authorized the translation. See, I anticipate this argument. Well, modern dictionaries, they don't say what the words mean in the early 17th century when the Bible was translated. Okay, here's one from 1604. Here's what it says the word means. Done. End of discussion. Bottom line. See you next week. Okay? I don't want to end on a negative note. I want to end on a positive note. I am glad I am born again. Okay? I still, my own preference, and probably not going to go running around using that word because there is confusion associated with it, but I'm also not going to jump down everybody's throat. I have no problem with saying and identifying the fact that I am born again. I am regenerate. I am a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? New. And Israel needed that. Every individual Israelite needed that, and every person alive today needs that to be a part of what God is doing, to be born of the Spirit. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We pray if there's anybody listening here today that has not been born of the Spirit, that has not trusted the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would do so today before it's everlasting too late, that they would stop trying to get there on the basis of their own work, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, and thank God for your mercy. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Praise God Almighty that we are regenerated and renewed.